So welcome to Music, Philosophy, and More, episode number three, with your host, John Henry Sheridan. And today I have a very special guest, Nemanja Rabich, with us. Hello, everyone. So um, this is the first time I'm doing the podcast from my uh, basement live with the guest in person, the touchable guest, not a virtual guest. So, uh, yeah, and we have a table. We're six feet apart, we measured. <laughs> Maybe. Um, so, uh, so please uh, let us know if you can hear us okay. All right. So, so um, for those of you who don't know, Nemanja is a friend of mine for a good 10 plus years now, and he is an excellent guitarist, one of the best guitarists I've ever met. And he's a songwriter, he's a composer, he's a sound guy. He's a, uh, an aspiring lute player now. And, yet, um, not yet. <laughs> and a world traveler. So uh, I'd just like to uh, take a moment and ha have him tell us a little bit about himself in his own words. I surprised us on him, by the way, so uh, he's going to do just great on the you know, last-minute notice here to be invited. So, Nemanja, please tell us a little bit about yourself, your background with music, and who you are. Okay, where to start? Well, I was born... <laughs> No, I was uh, I was born in Serbia. I, yeah, I've been playing music about well, almost three decades now, and um, I play guitar. Started when I was twelve. Uh, it's been a great journey, changed my life, uh, that's for sure. And um, now I've been in U.S. for the last thirteen years, I guess. And uh, I lived in Amsterdam for five years where I studied guitar at the conservatory, jazz and also classical guitar and a bit. And then I spent some time in India, about half a year. I studied Indian classical music. And yeah, I mean, it's been wonderful. What year, what year was your India study? Um, that was in 2007, like a first half, like end of 2006 and then till June 2007. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, just hearing that date <coughs> takes me back. The, uh, to the end of 2006 was when I, uh, when my last rock band broke up. So that was like when I was beginning to kind of take a new journey myself, mm -hmm. you know. So, cool. um, so it sounds like you've explored music on many fronts and many traditions, mm -hmm. uh, and you really dove deep in terms of. Um, seeing it for what it is on the surface level than seeing what it is on a spiritual level. And uh, I'd like to ask you, can you remember what it was that got you into music in the first place when you were a child maybe or a teen, whatever it was? Hmm. Uh, it was so long ago. I remember, well, even as a kid, I used to, like a little kid, like three, four, I used to listen to some, you know, like, uh, uh, local or domestic bands and just play on my plastic tennis racket. Mm -hmm. That was kind of the first. And before that, my mom would tell me that I used to ask her to play music when I was like less than a year old. And then I would wow. be just Amazing. holding myself on and just jumping around. So music has been there always. And my mom told me a story. It was like a clear summer night when I was born. It was like a like a band playing in the park, hmm. like next to the hospital. So I guess it's been there since forever. Um, but then, yeah, I started playing guitar like most of people in my generation, like in generation hearing like Guns N' Roses and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I was about 12 or 13. I found a broken guitar in the house and started strumming and trying to do something with it. And then my parents were like, he wants to get you a, like a guitar. <laughs> like, yeah. So they got me some cheap guitar in a local store. And yeah, I started strumming. And that was it. Took some lessons in the beginning, but didn't last long. And then I was just like ordering tabs in those days, you know. Mm -hmm, yeah listening to me like recordings and you know reading the tabs trying to play you know all those shredding solos on a like acoustic classical guitar wow. <laughs> stuff like that so yeah 
Well, we got a comment from Darlene, I can see. It just says, Indian, classical, wow, or awesome. Yeah, so uh, I thought so too when I first met you, Nemanja, and I learned that um, you uh, studied Indian classical yeah, music. I, I, I was fascinated. A bit, yeah. A bit. Yeah, if you, um, I, we can take this conversation in any direction, so if you could tell us a little bit about what that must have been like or what that was like for you, you know, a European, right? You're born in Europe, and uh, you end up in... India studying a tradition that's not your native one, right? Mm. And uh, somehow you had to be flexible enough to to make it your own, I imagine, to some degree, in order to learn. What was that experience like? Uh, well, it was fascinating. Um, my first, it's very interesting because, as I said, when I started playing music, I was into all this, like, rock or whatever, um, and then I, my brother-in-law, who unfortunately is not longer, well, you know, um, he committed a suicide some time ago. And, um, like, he had a record player in his house, like a pretty nice gear. I remember I loved going, and he had nice guitars that I later inherited. So I loved going to his, uh, in my sister's place and listening to all these old records. He had a bunch of records. And I remember I found this le a record which said Shakti with John McLaughlin. I saw a photo of John McLaughlin holding his guitar, which had like scalloped frets. They, they had like frets that were inlaid. Like I've never seen a guitar like that. So it's kind of like a half guitar, half Wiener, half mm -hmm. sitar. Right. And I was like, what is this? Let me hear this. So I put this record on and it started like something I never heard. It just was like, Takiri mi takiri. <laughs> you know, I was like, wow, this is cool. And then they start playing and the whole band comes in. It's like this high energy music with violin, guitar, and it's like total shredding. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't know it was possible to play guitar like this. <laughs> and uh, it fascinated me, even though I was not into that music at all. So what happened was that for years I was listening to that record, Handful of Beauty from Shakti, and that kind of kept my passion uh, going and then years after when I was studying in the conservatory I got back into it and started digging a little bit deeper and uh, uh, I had friends who were studying Indian music before and I started studying tabla a bit and I got a little bit deeper into it and um, eventually I went to Bangalore I wanted to learn the South Indian style Carnatic style which was older and there's a Hindustani or North Indian, which is more popular in the world or more known to the world. Uh, it was popularized by Ravi Shankar, you know, and during the 60s and later. And, uh, uh, every, you know, most of the people know sitar, tabla. But actually, South Indian music is like an old, older system. And it's not as known. And it's a little bit harder to get used to in mm -hmm. terms of listening. It, it's a little bit more complicated melodically and rhythmically. But I felt, you know, I want to go to the roots. So I studied percussion and singing in South India hmm. for a while. And uh, it was really fascinating. However, I have to admit, like, because I come from Balkans and Serbia, in our traditional music, we have a lot of odd metrics because our language is actually odd metrics. So there's, like, a lot of connection there. Hmm. So it, in that sense, it wasn't as hard for me to recognize some of the more complex rhythms that are present in Indian music, especially South Indian. I remember listening to some Baltic bands uh, early, when I was in college days, really surprised by the odd meters and like how fluidly they, yeah, yeah. they went in and out, seeing them live and like they had such energy and it was a real party, you know? Yeah, it's a part of the language. So it, it, it does sound like uh, natural. And it has you have to count it differently though, because it's always like one two one two one two three one two one two one three. It's never counted like one two three four five six seven one two. So people get lost in this. There's like all groups of two and three, which also exists in Indian music, but it's because it's a classical form. It's much broader and it's more complex in that sense. And especially South India, there's so many so-called talams or rhythmic cycles that people need to master. And I'm, I'm, you know, I didn't dig that deep. I more got a sense 
Uh, Did you have a primary teacher or were you kind of learning from various people? Yeah, I, I had a, two primary teachers, one for Mridanga and one for singing. And my Mridanga teacher is a great guy, M. Vasudeva Rao. He's uh, trained like thousands of kids and a very nice guy. And he, um, he said yes to training me, so I was very happy. And he gave me so much stuff that I still pretty much didn't really go through. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't play Mirdingham anymore. I don't have time, but it helped me develop an understanding what that music is. So, you know, it's all about rhythm and melody. There's no really concept of harmony in Indian classical music. So, mm -hmm. I was going to say, so is it true that India, Indian music doesn't really have chords? Well, you could say so. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's based mostly on the melodic development and rhythm development within the cycles and then the ragas which are very hard to explain. It's a very, um, it's a beautiful con concept and very old one, thousands of years old. So, yeah. Yeah, all I know is I love Indian music and uh, I love that I don't understand it too. I like that. Yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, you know, and I probably don't, probably in this lifetime won't really get deep into it and that's good for me, that's fine. I like that mystery. And it is funny how it, it doesn't sound like a mono, you know, it's not like a, a single chant of one voice, you know, m mono, uh, what do you call it, just one note moving, one melody. Yeah. Because there's a lot of, usually textures, depending on the music. So it sounds like there are kind of harmonies. Of course, there are crossing notes and everything. But um, I know, like you said, fundamentally, it's not a, it's not chord-based whatsoever, right? No. But the, the interesting thing is like, and this uh, is something I won't forget, it's, I was with my uh, singing teacher, G. Ravi Karen, he's a great guy. And uh, he, he said like, for us, notes are like stepping songs. Like the way Westerners think of scales, it's very different because we have notes and we play those notes and that's a scale. However, in um, Indian classical music, the charm is, be he said, our music is between the notes. Mm -hmm. So the charm is in the, what in the north they call means, or the bands uh, in the south, they call it gamakas. Uh, it, that's the flair of the music. And those are those notes that you hear. Like, when, I mean, I can't sing that music properly, but it's, you know, you're basically starting a note from another note and that journey between those notes, what we call in Western music, maybe sliding, Mm -hmm. is the charm of the music and each raga has a different expressions of that so it's a wonderful thing you know the, uh, you know like what you hear indian mm -hmm. singers do the whole music is based around that vocal quality and you have similar things in chinese music too but i think chinese music is also very broad and very universal in a way mm -hmm. and in some ways more simple right maybe the um, its own tradition is clearly or as, as well, it does, it does, but it's, years. yeah, but it's like based on different, I think, um, uh, there's a lot of pentatonic scales in Chinese music, but the, mm -hmm. there's also that vocal quality and mm -hmm. the way the notes are expressed. It's very expressive. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Now that you mentioned that, I do think I've heard Japanese music, especially when I was living there in Japan, that did give, give me a little bit of a, an India feel just by the way the voice is uh, approached, and, which is very different from a Western, you know, style. Yeah, more bend notes, not as mm -hmm. flat. Yeah, more, more nasal sounds that are, like, uh, celebrated there that here mm -hmm. maybe not so much. Yeah, there's not much coloring. But yeah. 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 Cool. So I got another question for you. I just uh, take a second to send uh, some shout-outs. So uh, just saying hello to some people who I see are joining our uh, watch party here. Hello, Darlene. Hello, Nick. Hello, Alexis Ray. Hello, everyone. Dennis Sembolo, Lonnie Friedland, Patricia Leonard, Luciano, Max, uh, Joe Melillo. And uh, if you want to shout out to anyone, feel free. Um, I see a lot of people sending a wave. Yeah. Probably can't read all of them. But I love you all, <laughs> and I'm really happy you're here with us. So yeah, awesome. So I got another question for you, Nemanja. Hope you're ready. All right. Shoot. Okay. So, uh, if you're willing to share, what were the names of your two or three bands 
And then what years were they active? Where did you rehearse? Dang. Uh, well, I don't know if I should mention my high school bands. They really were not that, um, they didn't have much impact on, but I, I remember some bands, like for instance, <laughs> my name, that's so funny. I had a band in Am Amsterdam called Neanderthal Alien. Oh, okay. And that was the band that I came to, to uh, like first, yeah, that brought me to yes, uh, to US in the first place. My friend Raj and Steve and yeah, it was it was awesome. We were like basically a bunch of musicians and we we, we made tunes on the spot. <laughs> but we had a we had a like certain form and a way of doing it, and uh, it was it was so much fun. And I remember I fell in love with U.S. Then I just wanted to stay here. Wow. It was lovely. So that that that's funny. And then um, I don't know. Actually. So would you call that a tour? Or what would you call? Yeah, it was a kind of it was a tour. We like uh, mm -hmm. my friend booked some shows and we played different places. We went to Colorado and then Texas and uh, spent some time in Midwest too. And it was like. It was, yeah, it was magical to land in Denver in the night and see Rockies and wow. yeah, and my yeah. friend called up a friend that he didn't see for over a decade from high school and he said like, hey man, you know, I'm here with like a few other guys, can we sleep at your house in Boulder? And the guy was like, yeah, come on. And wow. It was a great intro to American hospitality. Yeah. Wow. So it was lovely. And that was Neanderthal alien? <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> We music? even did made t-shirts. We oh, made t-shirts, yeah, with the Neanderthal and alien holding hands. It was so oh, funny. Yeah. I wish I had that. Uh, Do you have one? Do you have one? No, I don't anymore. You could probably sell it for good money. <laughs> well, actually, someone has them. But, uh, yeah, I wasn't really, uh, I didn't really invest into them, so I don't have much. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, wow. And, and how long was that for? Uh, it seems like a, maybe a one tour or something. The whole band experience. So you yeah, yeah, it was no, it was like we we did like a the, the band change form. We had a, like a singer come in next year, so that was like yeah, those two years. I think uh, like uh, two thousand. Well, no, the first time I came to us was end two of two thousand four, I think, and beginning two thousand five, and then came back in two thousand six, uh, summer two thousand six, I think. Uh, so that was like. It was just funny looking mm. back at it. And then um, I don't remember, I was never really good with band names. And then a lot of uh, the music I did, I played solo lately. I mean, during, over the years. I had a, like some other bands in the, since I came to New York. Um, one was really fun. The, we played a few shows. It was called Directions. Mm -hmm. I was it, like with uh, friends that... We're in the like Indian classical music circle. That was so much fun. Great musicians like Joshua Geisler and uh, Arun Ramamurti and Matt Kilmer, Aaron Hansen, uh, if I remember everyone, like violin, guitar, flute, percussion, like mm -hmm. so much fun. And we played some shows around New York. It was like, yeah, so much fun to do that. Like raga, like raga based music. Just yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was really cool. And then what else? I played in a prog rock. I like played Hasina. Yeah, that was another like a cool kind of rock R&B band uh -huh. in New Hasina? York. Yeah, a singer, Hasina and uh, Daryl Brooks. Uh, great musicians. Uh, great people. Galaxy of Tar. That was with Naima Mora, who won like Tyra Banks, an American model top model whatever galaxy of so, guitar yeah yeah that was the name of the band that yeah for a short while i played with them as well hmm. yeah those are names that come to me cool. but then yeah i mean the rest was mostly like in the last few years i've been mostly doing like acoustic shows well then later actually i i, I started a band with two good friends from australia called sonic bell Mm -hmm. And we spent a few years playing together, and there was good seeds also with one of them and a different singer, Katie and Kate, and then that was lovely. That was a very different, uh, yeah, I would say, I era. Yeah, really yeah it was really cool. 
and uh, we kind of had a different type of connection as well um, through our um, like a spiritual practice mm -hmm. and we do Falun Gong yeah so we were raising awareness about persecution that is still going on in China tomorrow is the anniversary actually oh, really? 20. 21 years 21st year of horrible persecution wow. by the Chinese Communist like Party that. Yeah, that's when it started in '99. So that was a very, very, uh, very inspiring period as well. And uh, yeah, I remember seeing you periodically at that period, and you definitely had an inspiration to you musically that you carried with you. Um, yeah. Of course, you always do. But uh, at that time, I remember there was some excitement about that project. Yeah, it was great. It was really. Uh, so Love I it. see a comment from Darlene. I don't have uh, glasses. Can you read that to me if you could see it? They use their voice like an instrument. Yes, right. In, uh, I, I think she's probably referring to Indian music and, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Asian, Chinese, and Japanese perhaps. Yeah, indeed. Thank you for your comments. If anybody has a comment for uh, Nemanja, or uh, sorry, a question for Nemanja, please go ahead and, and ask. And uh, just a shout-out to uh, to. Thomas Scuderi, my good friend, who will be on this show on Tuesday, 3 p.m. ish. And uh, Constantine has just joined. Con Constantine is a good friend who uh, I played bass, played bass in some of my projects and uh, throughout the years. He just joined. <coughs> so it's good to have you guys here. Um, so I'm moving right along. Uh, would, so I, I think I know the answer to this, but uh, just for the sake of for our listener or audience who may not know, um, would it be fair to say that you there was some part of your youth, maybe a lot of it or maybe some of it, where you were chasing the rock star dream? I guess, yeah. Like a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, that's for sure. Um, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At what point... Uh, you know, I know a bit of your story, but at what point would you say you kind of sort of realized it was a dream or realized it was an illusion and chose a different path? Mm. Or are you still chasing the rock star dream? No. Um, well, I think it's it's more of a perspective. It's not really... Um, I think... Um, it's just like my perspective changed and I realized that's really not what I want mm -hmm. and uh, I feel um, that music is a gift and it's actually great artists are humble and they they uphold like high moral values and it, like my life changed especially yeah since I you know got into you know meditation practice and Falun Gong and stuff and my focus uh, shifted and I realized it's not about oneself and about personal stories or whatever it's about the whole and you know like the old tradition of bards and troubadours who you know help people through telling them stories through music and and or you know old classical traditions which came out of spirituality out of temples and um out of uh you know honoring the divine which is essentially, you know, music is a divine gift. So the focus changed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's more, it's also a process of self-purification and understanding more and getting rid of all the bad stuff in us mm -hmm. and uh, all that ego, and you know. Because popular culture is all based on that, pretty much. It's about you, about you, like you being bigger than life. But I think that's... First of all, it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, it's it's uh, very tragic. And it's a very sad way to live, trying to compete and to, you know, trying to project mm -hmm. yourself as being, like, better than others. And, like, and than life. like um, yeah, I made it and you guys all, you know, it's like a very sad perspective. But I think it's it comes also from a deep longing of people who are not, they feel that they're less than they are or maybe they feel they're not good enough and then it just you feel that's gonna fill that hole mm -hmm. you know in you or that you know compensate for that lack of 
you know, uh, confidence or insecurity or feeling that you're not good enough. And then, mm -hmm. and it, as you see, like a lot of people came out from very like sad, tragic stories into the stardom and then they ended up, ended up even worse. It's very sad sometimes how it ends up, but I'm not saying I'm not trying to judge anyone or I'm not like, you know, I'm not being on the other side. I think it's good to have influence if you're offering something good to people and I'm not in any way, uh, like against, you know, mm -hmm. any, you know, I'm not against people being famous or whatever. It's just like, a, what is the message behind it? What is the point? Is it truly a service to society? Is it something for others or is it something to gratify your own self, which is a very narrow goal? I want to just mention a comment that uh, um, listener and friend Con Constantine Medic said, honoring the divine, that's beautifully said. So I also know Khan is someone who takes music uh, very seriously and meaningful to his life. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I, I would like to agree, you know. I certainly feel that um, when music does honor the divine, uh, it's transformational, right? And mm -hmm. and when it doesn't, I don't know, I guess you could, is there like a retro transformation? <laughs> 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 I guess it, they, they, uh, it could be harmful, right? It, yeah. it, or it could be misleading. Or, you know, I mean, I, I could tell just from my own story, you know, that I, when I started, to, when I agreed, I'm going to listen to Guns N' Roses. I'm going to listen to Motley Crue. I'm going to listen to Anthrax. When I was a kid, I didn't want to. Like, I grew up listening to Irish music and dancing around and, you know, just having fun. I was a very pure-spirited kid, I would say, from what I understand about my history. Um, and that, But the kids in my neighborhood were listening to these bands. So I kind of took it as a challenge, like, I'm supposed to like them, too. <coughs> and the funny thing is, the ones who turned me on to these bands quickly forgot about them because it was like a fad for them. But for me, I, I latched on and that became my life. Um, but I knew when I was letting Guns N' Roses into my life that I, I knew for some reason if I had to hide it from my mom and my grandmother, there must be something bad about it. <laughs> you know, you probably shouldn't have to hide those things. But they were cursing left and right. I didn't really understand what they were cursing about. But, you know, it, there was a poison. Um, you there was a lot of coolness associated with it, and it was fun to unite with other people who were Guns N' Roses fans and stuff all the, over the years. I mean, Slash played amazing solos. I still think that. Yeah, super great guitar I mean, player. beautiful melodies and stuff, and, you know, they, they made some, like, pretty good songs. So, you know, I still see there's, like, qualities there. And, you know, Axl Rose spoke out against Chinese Communist Party and his sure. band from right. China. I mean, that's... Mm -hmm. That's amazing. He also, like, I think on the record, he mentions persecution of Falun Gong and whatever. Mm -hmm. I, you know, there, there's definitely good things about them. And I can't, you know, I personally, I, I can't say, uh, oh, I regret it or whatever. But, you know, it was a stage. I understand also what you mean. I think that's also uh, a good perspective. Yeah, I felt there was a challenge. Like, somehow in my life, I would have to dive into this sort of muddy muck and kind of learn to enjoy it and then finally later on learn to extract myself from it somehow hmm. and that, that that's what happened i would say and uh i still will listen to guns and roses but i'm just much more aware of how to you know not see them as as role models you know or yeah certainly, certainly not idols anyway yeah you know no. um but you know gun, to, to axel rose's credit and not to pick on Guns N' Roses because we clearly both respect them. Uh, Axel does say in, in the song Don't Damn Me, uh, he does say, um, like, basically don't do not do what I say because I'm no, I'm no role model. He says it. I forget the line. You know, don't idolize me or something to that effect. But anyway, um, so, yeah, I just uh, thought I would jump in with that. Um, so, so, I got another question for you. Yeah, sure. Um, so can you think of one or two songs that you wrote over the course of your musical career, three decades now about, right, you said, mm. that, uh, you're really proud of, um, and that you think actually really reflects a moment in time, like whatever moment that you were 
kind of going through something. It doesn't have to be sad or happy or whatever it is. But you say, you know, when I look at that song, yes, I'm glad I wrote it. That really captured something. I'm, I'm glad I'm leaving that legacy behind somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, like, um, I'm grateful for them. Um, somehow, in, in all honesty, like, I, I can't take much credit. Uh, the, the process of creation is sometimes very fast, and, you know, like, melody comes to me, or... There's a few I, I, I could really relate to. One was uh, one is definitely a song called The Promise, which I wrote like a few years ago. I, I remember I it, when I came came up from the melody on the guitar, and then I wrote out the lyrics. It, I was working at the Met. <laughs> I mean, I was in the gallery with paintings, and I remember writing the lyrics in my mind. But um, the promise is definitely one of those songs that kind of always evoke certain, like you know, magical feelings. And uh, "On My Wing" is one of the songs also that I feel um, really struck a chord within my heart. And um, yeah, and it just came to me somehow. It's like. Um, yeah, I can't explain it, but it was mm -hmm. a process of, I guess, internal process of uh, looking inside and trying to dig out the roots of some bad things that I find, and yeah. then songs come out. So, um, nice. yeah, something mm -hmm. like that. But of course, like every song has a story behind it. So. Yeah, and I can relate how you say it. It's hard for you to take credit for writing songs. I, I know that might sound funny to people who never wrote a song before, but I totally understand. You know, as a songwriter, I've written tons and tons of songs, but I don't feel like that's uh, I feel like it's um, important to honor it, but I don't feel like it's impressive in any way to, that I've written so, so many songs because it's like it's just a process that, you know, I don't want to be vulgar, but a little bit like going to the bathroom, you know, for an artist, you have to kind of just get rid of this something. I have to, anyway. Maybe not everyone feels it, but I have to get, not get rid of, but um, release certain energies in me. And for me, it's songwriting, you know. So I've written many, many songs. People can say whether they're good or bad, it doesn't matter. But they came from me, and I've sh spent time in the craft. And some of the work that I feel best about, I have no idea how the melody came. You know, I have no idea besides that I just put in the time, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I don't feel like I created it in a sense. I, I feel like I allowed it, you know, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I feel like I just said, okay, you know, and usually when inspiration knocks, it's not the most convenient time, you know, <laughs> it can be, I guess, but usually it's like, all right, I got a melody, so I just got to or words, I got to write it down, otherwise it's going to disappear. I don't know. I just thought I'd sort of add my... Yeah, yeah, yeah. About that. Yeah, sure. Makes sense. So, uh, once again, thank you, everyone, for watching. Uh, if you have any questions for Nemanja or, or myself, uh, you know, feel free to chime in. Uh, a few more shout-outs. Louis Diego Paris, Janice Chan, uh, and Tom, and uh, Lou. I don't know if I mentioned Louis LaRocco. Uh, he's been uh, doing these shows with me, uh, supporting, hosting on his end, and co-hosting sometimes. So thanks for checking in, Lou. Um, so, Nemanja, <coughs> uh, can you tell us two of your more fond memories of pursuing a musical career? Mm. Um, just something that, you know, kind of sparkles when you think about it. Mm, in which way, like? Uh, well, uh, you know, pr uh, earlier this evening we were talking about, you know, a mountaintop uh, experience or something like mm -hmm. that. But it could be, you know, um, just something that if you weren't pursuing your music, uh, it probably wouldn't have happened. You know, so like holding your newborn baby doesn't count. Something different. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like a memory that sparks. Well, I mean, um, I could say in more general sense, what is the, like music brought me all over the world pretty much. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, they've done three different continents and I traveled a lot 
because of music. Actually, that was the sole reason why I left my country. And then, um, I mean, there was some additional motivation there because when I was growing up, it was just crazy and there was a lot of uh, tribulations. And, but um, yeah, I could say music brought me all over the world and there were like many magical scenes I can remember. Um, playing in different places. I remember one of my favorite experiences uh, was when I played a uh, festival in Bangalore, India. It was this uh, wonderful all night festival. My friends, um, Gopal and Gita Navale, organized. And it was under a huge banyan tree, an amphitheater in the middle of the farm outside of the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was magical. I played like maybe 4.30 in the morning. Wow. <laughs> it was an all-night thing. And they had like a little cottage rooms for us to rest. If we, But of course, I didn't sleep. And it was packed with people even 4 or 5 in the morning. <laughs> and it was so much fun. I played with one of the local musicians there, uh, Kartik Mani. is a very talented percussionist. Son of a famous uh, Merdangam teacher and uh, player, T.S. Mani, who just recently passed away unfortunately and um it was so much fun to play it's, i'll never forget it was a magical thing and people audience was wonderful bangalore so you were playing kinda... the music of this other guy or, or uh you... no we played uh some of the uh, original i think I, I played some actually a macedonian tune or two mm -hmm. uh which is kind of interesting for them like i wanted to kind of play something from like my own backyard uh, and um, we played um, traditional, like, South Indian Tilana. And that was pretty cool. And uh, some, maybe some of my original tunes as well. Mm -hmm. So it was very, very exciting. A magical night. I mean, I, I have some, some of those, uh, like, a musical adventures. Mm -hmm. uh, like oh, a yeah, dream. Like dream. Um, and uh, I, I've been always like a lover of nature, so um, yeah, it's just one of my um, say ultimate pleasures is to play in like beautiful natural places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's one experience I remember on top of my head. But there were quite a few. It's very yeah. fortunate. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think a sonny told me uh, like. Just when you traveled to the Grand Tetons and do a music video there, right? Oh yeah, that was that was wonderful as well. And uh, that was more like really, I just wanted to do that, and I planned it. And mm -hmm. uh, and um, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, that's one of my favorite places in the world, Grand Tetons and Yellowstone. And it's just like I love. Yeah, I just love. Uh, I love that place. I love like swimming in the cold lakes and. <laughs> You know, it's just uh, seeing huge mountains, and it's very inspiring. Wow, it's swimming in cold lakes. So I, I wish I could say I love that. But, uh, oh, I, I love it. I it was really, it was really amazing, very invigorating, and uh, it's great. So um, I'm just gonna jump a little bit here, uh, just to keep it moving. Uh, your stories are fascinating. I could, I'm sure you have. 25 more of those but uh those stories like that or yeah i mean 300 i don't know but um but anyway uh thomas has a question and lou says hello so hey lou hello to everyone uh lou and i were just on three hours a couple of nights ago so we miss you lou wish you were here too lou, lou's a, an old friend and musician and uh, awesome good guy um so tom says and this is a question I want to start including in the podcast. I think it's interesting. Um, how did you guys first meet? So what I want to say, actually, that's a question I want to begin to ask is tell me how we met because my story is going to be different from your story, from, from everyone's because our memories are all unique and it's kind of selective, right? That's true. If I remember, we met in the Brooklyn Music House, right? Mm -hmm. that's Where we both taught guitar. If, if I remember, I met you in the in the basement room. You just came down. I was teaching there, mm -hmm. and then there was a break time, so you came down and you were having your piece, like <laughs> like I think yeah, you had the the hippie like the piece thing. Like I think 
oh, a really? necklace or something. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Your long hair and stuff. Back then I had my long hair too. Mm -hmm. I remember and uh, I think you were reading something, maybe like I got taller or so I don't know. Yeah, remember. Probably that's not you know that knowing that time period that's yeah. what I was really Yeah, I was really time. into that too at that period, so hmm. yeah. So what would you put that around two thousand eight? It was 2008 for yeah. sure. That's when okay. I started teaching there. Okay. Like maybe April, May, June. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I spent many years there. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, because I, I was a lone guitar teacher there for a while, a few years. I don't actually remember when I joined. So then when you came, like, I believe you were the second guitar teacher there, I think. So I'm like, who's this other guy, you know? And he had this name that. I had to hear it like five <laughs> times before I got it. Yeah, now, but right I was that, determined. Much, that's I right. was determined to get it. I kept going, "What's his name again?" That's yeah. why I <laughs> tell people call me Nemo. That's yeah. But it, no, it's a cool name, so it's, it's worth it's worth repeating, right? Yeah, it means nothing, literally. So that's the meaning in Serbian. Then, no, yeah, the one who doesn't have or not having or it's oh, really? like a. Yeah, it's like an old Taoist name, you know, mm -hmm. what would the Chinese say, like, That's because Taoists right? talk about nothingness, yeah. Oh, do you know what Amanya means? No. In Portuguese, it means tomorrow. Well, yeah, yeah. something like Amanya. mañana. Yeah, if you if you spin it, if you say mañana, 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 yeah. then it kind of almost turns into my name, but, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. Every time we heard Amanya when we were in... Brazil, Yoko, me, <laughs> we made an Amanya joke. It was, it was <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> let's uh, keep this party going. Do you have any questions there? Or I, see I don't have any questions. Just, just wave. Just saying hello. Shankar Gopal. Hello. Many people send the wave. Um, and I'm so happy to see them here. My blessings are gone. Okay. We're doing a lot of fusion. Yeah, all right. There's a lot of music out there that's a fusion of Asian and French. Yeah, there, there's a lot of uh, music out there that does uh, is a fusion of Western and Eastern and jazz and classical and all sorts of cool stuff. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite artists, I don't know if I told you, I, I must have, uh, is uh, Andreas Vollenweider. Yeah, the, the, the harpist. harpist yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I, I would say he's He's world music. He's new age. It's a fusion. I don't know. It's just beautiful. So Andreas Vollenweider, if you don't know him, check him out, guys. So let's get this uh, let's get this interview back on track. Next question. So, what is one of the greatest lessons you've learned along your let's say musical journey? If you want to make it just your whole life journey, what's one of the greatest lessons you've learned that keeps you positive and upbeat and determined to move forward? Um, I guess the hardship is good mm -hmm. because that there's always there's always going to be a time of adversity but it's what you make out of that no matter how cliche that sounds I feel like that you know, to take hardship as joy is the greatest reward, really. Yeah, because not, nothing happens in this world, really. Nothing good happens without a <clears throat> hardship, really. Mm -hmm. Like, truly, things that are lasting, you always have to put effort into them. And, um, I mean, yeah, it's really true. Like, uh, I mean, throughout my life, I faced that um, choice, like everyone, many times. How do you look at it? Are you going to just keep, you know, when you fall, you're going to keep on lying down? Or are you going to get up and keep on going and learn something from it? So I think that's the choice we all face. And um, so maybe that, in, tell me if this sounds right. So for you, what, the lesson you learned is kind of just more than just hearing that that hardship is good for you. You kind of somehow experience that. Yeah, I mean, of course, I think everyone does. 
Uh, the thing is, like, even even just looking at the musical journey, what really kept me going throughout many years when I was growing up in Serbia was really rough times. Uh, was music. I mean, I it was like uh, like every hardship would get transformed into energy to kind of push forward and like trans you know it, it just goes into the music and and later on like uh a lot of things that you know a lot of songs that, that were written came out of breaking through certain barriers and um you know like working on character and, and that's like the most rewarding thing really and that's when the real stuff happens and uh, i mean if i didn't like for instance one of my turning points uh, in life was bombing when nato bombed serbia in 99 that was when i decided to leave the country follow my heart try to study music because until then i didn't really believe it was possible and i never went to music schools and i you know i thought like me going to conservatory without like formal music education is like impossible but then i made it i just like after that i realized like wow you know never dreamed they'll have bombs falling on my city destroying the bridges and i'd be watching it and in like on the party in great amusement and awe and like seeing all these so it was like crazy times but it really just uh made me determined to follow my heart because i realized like we we uh, we think we're in charge but our yeah. lives are very well planned and we better follow the divine plan and just follow your heart and uh I, and i don't mean like a fleeting emotion of like excitement like yeah this is what i want to do and tomorrow is gone no there's something that's deeply within you that you feel you have to follow so i guess that's the most valuable thing and it's not easy to remember always because it, it hurts mm -hmm. when you when you're in pain it hurts yeah yeah and it's not fun can be otherwise like it wouldn't be pain mm -hmm. so you know it <laughs> love the pain <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like you just gotta remember <laughs> when we're in pain that uh you know just hang in there that's kind of the main thing you gotta remember hang in there and just and it's like trust that we're gonna get perspective on this it's gonna yeah change. It's gonna change. and it's good it's good i mean you know every every uh tradition you know has that you know like hardship is good and essentially you're paying off your debts or you know in east they call it karma or it's all good for us so yeah and it, i i think every you know on the most simple level every successful person can say that like i mean really it's not um it's just like hardship gives meanings to things so mm -hmm. it's, it's good for us and i think that's kind of uh, where the best art happened for me was after like transcending certain things in life yes I do. not to say that it's you know like transcended a lot or like accomplished much it's more like uh, you know just uh, like my humble understanding <laughs> your evolution Teams, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, and got you to where you are now. Um, so I, maybe this is the same question. If it is, we can move on to another question. But what aspect of your life philosophy helps you to recover from setbacks, um, musical or otherwise? I think it's more like my the the, the cultivation practice. I do Falun Dafa, which is based on truth, compassion, and tolerance. And um, I, I think that changed my life in the most fundamental way, like how to look at things and uh, just uh, try my best to treat everyone and everything that happens with truth, compassion, tolerance, which is very easy to talk about, but sometimes very hard to do. And sometimes we're not, like, I'm not you know, even aware of where I should position myself or that I'm not really in line. And, you know, it's it's a process of, you know, human world is complicated sometimes and we all have 
uh, things that we think are good, but then after a few years we realize, oh man, that wasn't so good. <laughs> so it's a constant process. And I think that's that's the most fundamental change because uh, everyone, whatever we do, it's like we are bringing our character into it. And if we work on our character, everything that happens will become better. That's kind of the perspective. Mm -hmm. So basically your uh, your daily practice, mm -hmm. your daily faith practice at Kaleem Dafa mm -hmm. is uh, what you would write it, uh, which helps you recover from setbacks and look at things Absolutely. from a point of view. Absolutely. Like taking hardships. Which There's joy. daily meditation, right? Well, it involves, yeah, th there is a physical aspect, which is like five exercises mm -hmm. for standing and fifth one is sitting. They're done with the music. And um, I mean, Falun Dafa is not a, like it's a spirit, like a cultivation of mind and body. It's completely free. There's no temples or like any kind of religious rituals involved. It's all about like self-improvement, really. And uh, there's a book which explains the principle. There are many books, but the main book is uh, Juan Fallon and explains all the principles of the practice and uh, which, you know, one can read daily and uh, enlighten to new things constantly. And um, it's wonderful. And then, you know, I, be, I have to say, I take my health for granted, but I've been perfectly healthy for like, over a decade, I don't even remember. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's really, it's yeah, it's a huge, it's a great blessing mm -hmm. um, to have something like that in my life. Yeah. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Uh, Thomas does. Oh, okay. Thomas uh, asked a question. Um, what was the first time you guys played music together? So it is true we have played music together. Not so officially, but many times, right? We our hands are strumming the guitar at the same time. That's true. Um, can you remember the first time we might have played together? I think I remember actually. Do you? Yeah, I was going to chime into the question of when when was the first time we met. I would add to that. <coughs> shout out to Dave Carduna for joining. What's going on, Dave? Uh, I would add to that. Two thousand eight going into the basement, this is a common memory that we both have. Um, I realized your name was Nemanja, or I didn't realize yet, and I, and I went up and asked Miss Yan afterwards, hey, what's his name? <laughs> uh, or you told me and I forgot. But I learned you were going to India. But I, I didn't go to India until 99 June, uh, January. So maybe I just knew about it and then later told you that I was going to go to India. Anyway, when I went to Brazil in, uh, at the end of 2010, um, no, 2009, sorry, I did that show at the church, the fundraiser. Did I ask you to play at that maybe? And then we yeah. did some together? Yeah, that's true. And we performed to like a duet, the improvised yeah. duet thing. That was probably the first time we probably yeah. practiced anything. I think so, together. yeah. Yeah. I remember that. <laughs> I remember that was before you left for Japan, right? Uh, that was before I left for Brazil. Brazil? Oh, really? Oh, maybe because if, if if you remember it as being right before I left for Japan, then that means it wouldn't have been until a year later, which I did a similar thing at the. Well, church. yeah, and that's where we played together. It's when I before I left for Japan, not not Brazil. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So 2010. Yeah. Not 2009. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. If I mean, if that sounds right to you, it sounds right to me. Oh, I have a question from my my friend and colleague Ilya. He says, "Am I to plan to record your solo album?" Well, actually, I have a solo album already, which is on all the major platforms, streaming platforms. It's mm -hmm. called High Abode, mm -hmm. and it's a solo um, guitar like EP, I said, like six tunes or something. Mm -hmm. So you can check that out. So uh, high abode, Nemanja Rebic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. On all those, like whatever, like Spotify, <laughs> mm -hmm. Amazon, yeah, music Apple platforms. Music. Yeah, it's all in there, and mm -hmm. the YouTube. Uh, yeah, I could put in the show notes. Uh, please remind me. I'll, I'll sure. add that there for anyone who's like a photo to check it out. with, like, Grand Tetons in the back. It's like when I was making uh, the video, this same mm -hmm. song. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, so he does have one solo album out. Maybe, is it a he? Uh, he a yeah, he yeah, yeah. Maybe he wants to know when your next one's coming out. Uh, I don't have a plan. You know, I'm kind of uh, in between since this whole thing happened. Mm -hmm. Like, um, uh, we'll see how long it lasts. So now I have time. So maybe it is a good time to record some music. We'll see. I haven't been planning. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but I definitely, I still, you know, like uh, publish videos and stuff. I definitely keep on. Uh, you know, producing music and stuff, mean? sharing music. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's more of a thing these days. It's more of an interactive and, you know, like, like what we're doing now or like posting videos and stuff. It's kind of like what reaches people these days even more mm -hmm. than, you know, just releasing an album or something. Uh, sure. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, I have mixed emotions about releasing stuff. I'm still hell-bent on releasing tons of music for posterity but yeah. um, but I do feel that things like this or posting a video yeah and people go to YouTube very like, often to yeah. listen to music I mean yeah. so it's very you know. sure yeah I, I totally understand all right uh, I've uh, moved them right along if you're good to continue a bit, yes of course yeah we have some coffee here yeah. In the late hours. Yeah, people should understand that. It's very important. <laughs> <laughs> if you uh, get interviewed on music philosophy and more, there needs to be... Uh, if you go to a podcast, you need a cup of coffee. A cup of coffee and, and a cup of water. Exactly. And all four cups. Or, or barley. Well, not barley. No, barley a Japanese, doable. like, yeah, summertime Japanese tea. tea. Yeah, Even better than tea. water, yeah. Yeah. As long as you have two beverages, one for hydration and one for uh, stimulation, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you're good. <laughs> um, so, uh, so how has your music career shifted over the years? So how many? Yeah, let's give it that. I have another similar question, but so where did you start? Where did you go? Where did you go? Where Where are you now? Hmm. To be honest, like, I don't, like, um, I can't say, I mean, you know, it's, it, I can't say I've been, um, like, music career, like, yeah, sure, I had projects, but, you know, it wasn't, like, something, like, you know, like, a lot of people had to uh, do different jobs, uh, which also brought a lot of different experience to me, and, uh, you know, and then share music whenever I can. Uh, luckily at, at that point where I, you know, because I have a family, I'm a father, you know, and, um, at that point, like, you know, <clears throat> you have to set certain priorities in life. But uh, the fortunate thing is that at that point I also had a, you know, I played music for so many years so that even if I take a break from it, I don't really lose my touch with it and with my instrument and stuff. So it takes can always get back into shape relatively quickly but i can't i mean evolution it's more a, i look at it not as much as my career development because it's like i can't really say much of a career i did like certain interesting things like uh, uh over the years but it's more about like what was worked on that is more like you know like with sonic bell or whatever we played some festivals around and um, to spread awareness, uh, as I was saying, about prosecution. Or, you know, I did a guitar master's. Uh, I did one competition in 2016. That was really a mm -hmm. uh, cool experience and, uh, like, met tons of, you know, great guitarists, really. And that was something that my friend got me into, kind of pushed me into. I wasn't even planning to do that or, like, really wanted. I was like, oh, that's another thing to do. Like, uh, mm -hmm. make a video, send it, and... But then, you know, I did it and I got into finals and went to Poland. That was a great experience. And uh, so I, I can't say, I, I think it's more uh, what is, um, is the inner journey that was more really more exciting for me. And, uh, um, and at the moment, you know, of course I was teaching guitar at the same time and work through different uh, places. And then... Um, now I'm like musician. I started doing sound engineering job as well, which is very interesting. 
-hmm. and um that's something I, i've been like producing music for like tv for um, ntd and like different documentaries um like uh, composing music and uh, like doing stuff on my own and uh, collaborating with people so that was like another aspect that i really like doing and um like music that is more following the story of a mm -hmm. movie or and evoking certain feelings you know that are present in the so it kind of shifts your focus and makes you follow the story more and uh, like kind of see how you can fit in um so that that's another thing and then the sound engineering job which i'm doing now most of the time is very um fulfilling and interesting and um it, it's a totally different aspect where i'm not the you know i'm not the performer i'm the guy behind the scenes mm -hmm. to uh i have to make sure that what's coming out is um you know sounds good and making um, other people sound good which is uh, a wonderful perspective really and mm -hmm. i'm very comfortable with that because i don't feel like you know i don't really um i find it very meaningful and you know where it's me on the stage or you know behind it doesn't really matter do you so. find i'm wondering that being responsible for making other people sound good uh, I imagine that might be even more uh, stressful or intense than, than being a performer yeah, itself. It yeah. is. It can be. And, but it's also very fulfilling. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it is definitely a lot of responsibility. And, um, and yeah, it's there's a lot of things that can go wrong, right, right. <laughs> even though you shouldn't be thinking that way. Right. But, I mean, and... Um, you know, especially working with analog gear, and which I do mostly. I, I like the analog sound. So it's, um, but yeah, it's a great thing. It's a, it's a it's a totally. Um, I'm very happy with that part of evolution mm -hmm. as a musician. Yeah. And um, but still, you know, I have plenty of time to create things. And if I'm touring or whatever, I have a lot of like, you know, I have downtime where I'm getting inspired by different things and, you know, I can mm -hmm. write down thoughts and write songs. And so it, it's, it's, it's pretty good. I've been, it's been a pretty amazing journey, I have to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like, like you've really seen a whole lot of life, you know. Yeah, I, I feel very fortunate and grateful. Like it, it has been too exciting <laughs> 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 I have to say <laughs> you know it, it doesn't lack excitement right. so yeah. I mean excitement or like I would say maybe it's not boring, right? no no right. yeah no I, I, would, um, I would think that's not boredom is not one of your problems I would imagine no, no. Um, actually I had a thought on that like I imagine if I was you know know what it's like to be the performer i know my personality so if someone who is doing the sound messes things up you know i know i can forgive them but if i'm or just overlook it or something but if i'm the one responsible for getting the sound right you know <laughs> i know what the performers think the performer or performers many are thinking so i would i would be probably nervous uh, to some degree anxious or yeah i mean it's a big responsibility uh you know it, uh, yeah it is it's mm -hmm. and it demands like a different type of focus and hard work it's great i mean and yeah listening really mm -hmm. well attention yeah, yeah. And, and i would say deep amount of faith probably right yeah <laughs> a lot a lot of faith but you know it's really being diligent and very focused but then still relaxed enough so you're not like you know so you can work calmly under pressure because mm -hmm. things might go wrong and you might not be able to see where the problem is and then you will but you have to figure out fast right, so, you gotta be... so it's like yeah it's a different state it's like alert and calm at the same time mm -hmm. and uh, you know not everyone feels comfortable doing that life sound is much more like the like like yeah you're dealing with a lot more pressure than you know being in studio or something it's 
relatively comfortable environment. I mean, even though they're, mm. you know, like the time is ticking away or whatever, but it's different yeah. when you're in a life situation, you know, there's a, mm, like a couple, you. like a few thousand people come mm. to see the show and it's, <laughs> you want to like have them leave happy. <laughs> right. And you know you don't want them to remember forever. Like oh, I remember that show, and that sound was horrible, <laughs> yeah. or you know, like yeah. something really bad happened. And you know, of course, you know that didn't happen. But mm. you know, it's really like um, it's a huge responsibility to mm. be in a production. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I cherish it, but yeah, it's not probably not for everyone. <laughs> mm. Not that kind of yeah. Hmm. All right, so moving along, uh, what do we got here? So uh, I think we, yeah, we kind of answered the how many hats you wore over the years. Uh, do you think we answered that? I, I like hats. You? I have two. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, you know, all those hats. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I guess you kind of discussed that you were you're a composer, you're a songwriter. You are a singer too, right? You don't yeah, advertise that. But no, are. I mean, I can't, I don't consider myself as like a really properly trained singer. And, you know, I wouldn't. I'm more of a guitarist and instrumentalist than a singer. But I do sing sometimes just out of, you know, very often out of necessity because, you know, I don't yeah, have time to team, right? meet with other people and work. Sometimes I do, like the, tomorrow I'm going to, or is it today already? <laughs> no, it's tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Gonna share a video with, that I did with a good friend, good singer, or a great friend and great singer, Mika Hale, and and that's wonderful. So I sometimes I have a chance to meet with mm -hmm. colleagues and do it, and I love that. You know, I, I love having great singer sing and I just mm -hmm. play guitar <laughs> yeah, yeah. but very often you know I'm on my own and I just don't have and then you know I just try to sing my best but mm -hmm. um, so yeah you're a singer, uh, when when you need to be you're a uh, guitar player uh, you you're a sound engineer mm -hmm. uh, have you ever I know you record your own music, right? Is yeah. There a lot of recording your own music or just a bit? Yeah, I mean, like, uh, not a lot, but, I mean, the, the like, the album I did, I recorded myself mm -hmm. and mixed. And, and some and classical type pieces that I've heard you do, right? Yeah, yeah, and, you know, the stuff uh, that was done for, like, you know, TV documentaries and stuff, a lot of it was just done in my home, little, my home, my mm -hmm. little home studio, and, and, um, yeah, it's uh, like simple stuff. And have you ever recorded other artists or bands or something like that? That's not really. No, no, that was not. I mean, I was never into that so much. Like, uh, just curious. Like that. No, I didn't. Yeah, I was. I never really, like, yeah, that was not part of my path. I mean, these things that happened along the way were really just spontaneously happened and I learned how to do that stuff. Mm -hmm. Same with sound engineering. It was like baptism by fire, you know, mm -hmm. throw yourself in and figure it out. So I never really, I never planned to do this stuff. It just came. Mm -hmm. I never really pursued it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So all these, the one thing that I really pursued was a guitar and that was still, it's like that's just what was always my, you know, big passion. I always wanted to play guitar, and then that kind of brought me all over. But then all these other things that came later were pretty spontaneous. It was something that needed to be done, and I just had to learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, once I jumped into it, you know, I learned. And uh, it's like, plan. yeah, I mean, you just have to have faith, and if you, you know, feel you should do something, you do it, and you learn on the way. Mm -hmm. and uh and at the end it's like a lot of that st most of that stuff is really hands-on yeah. like no matter how you know it's you like it's stuff. really hard like <laughs> and and that's why like you, you're usually just thrown in like how do you you, you don't really pre you can't prepare for running a show like when you have an orchestra in a pit you know and like a big production show and like no matter how much you study <laughs> You just have to jump in and work under that pressure and learn stuff and be like twist the knobs and like okay, this is how it this sounds and you know this sounds like this and you know you learn through experience and that's it. It's very simple in the end. Mm -hmm. But yeah, 
take some courage. Yeah, it takes courage, willingness, willingness to to not look good, right? Or willing, yeah. Yeah, good, yeah, right? yeah, to be humbled. Yeah. Essentially, you're always going to be humbled. Yeah. Because you're bound to make mistakes. And when you make mistakes, you better take the responsibility <laughs> and just say, I messed up, I'm sorry, I'm going to do better next time. <laughs> And you do better next time. That's all it is. Yeah. And those are very good opportunities to improve character, I yeah. think. You know, yeah. and to then, like take the path of. It's not easy always, but you know, take the path of humility instead of defense. Or. Mm -hmm. And I, would would you agree that when you do that, the more often you do that, you take a path of humility, or just like uh, working for the greater cause, that you kind of just continue to pave your way as someone who is desirable right because then yeah. people see wow this guy is a team player this guy doesn't care if he makes mistakes he learns and he grows and that's the type of guy i want to, to work for me yeah i think so i think that's you know because uh it's one of the like good traits to have mm -hmm. no matter what you do you're always gonna be humbled <laughs> along the way it's just like how do you deal with that and it's, it's very often easier said than done mm -hmm. but um I, I think it's the only path to greatness really just no matter how great you are you just always the force that is greater so <laughs> <laughs> well, or how great you think you are yeah. it's it, there's no way you know there's always someone higher so yeah, and any new field you get to, right? Yeah, so. and I, I mean, not saying that it's all about competition, or not from that perspective, but more of a perspective of like, yeah, just serving, you know. It's just kind of, yeah, this is something for others, and you just want to do it great because you want others to experience good things from mm -hmm. it. And the more you think that way, more you'll be prone to to work better and work harder. Right, and the uh -huh. more you do good work, the more, I would say, the universe will respond and give you more w good work to do, kind of. Yeah, you know? simple. Yeah. Simple, yeah. profound <laughs> truth. But somehow, <laughs> yeah. it's easy to yeah. get lost. I mean, it's... Oh, yeah, it's so easy to... When you're in the weeds of it, I've been involved with some projects, and I know that it's... I believe in the cause, but then I feel along the way like, shoot, this is taking a lot out of me, you know? Like, am I allowing myself to be, am I putting too much in? Am I am I obsessive over the details? Am I, and I wonder, no, I'm putting so much attention to detail because I want it to be good, and if I don't, I might let things slip and the quality will go down. You know, sometimes I have that yeah, yeah. battle, so. Yeah. You know. So I have another question here. So if if you have any setbacks, are there any setbacks you'd feel comfortable to share that came up in your life where you learned a powerful life lesson? I don't know. Like you did try to do X, Y, and Z. It was a big failure, <laughs> and and then you learned something great, which led you to yeah. Z. It, well, it doesn't have to be that, but any any sort of setback. For me, diabetes is an obvious setback I like to talk about. Okay, it slowed me down, but it was beneficial. But it could be something totally different. Just wondering. Um, yeah, there were definitely uh, um, – let me see. Do you have one simple one I remember? A uh, very embarrassing thing. I was uh, – um, that was like when I first decided to try to go into the conservatory. I first went to Graz, Austria, and uh, and it's just uh, it was like a classic story. Like I went to the entrance exam along with like another friend of mine wanted to get into this school, and uh, I just like chose some like you know ridiculous like uh, hard fees and whatever and and. Uh, and it was just the wor like worst scenario for like an entrance exam is like a room full of audience <laughs> and like five teachers looking at you and I like me I, I barely ever even played like jazz with people and 
I mean, I I did, but you know, it's just like not in that situation. And I remember like my guitar was getting out of tune. It was just so bad. <laughs> and they like they laughed at me, you know, like the oh, teachers no. were laughing at me. It was like one of those moments where you're like, <laughs> you know, it was just, yeah, it's like really, really like a huge failure. But it's great. I mean, I didn't give up. After that, I didn't want to stay there anyway. I mean, I, I went back to Graz, spent some months there and didn't really dig it. And then uh, eventually my destiny left, but went, you know, took me to Amsterdam. And, and yeah, I didn't give up. I just kept on going. And when I went there, it was a very different story. Um, well, the situation was better with like a few guys, teachers in a small room, really relaxed, telling jokes and like being like, very mindful of like making people feel comfortable so they could perform mm -hmm. better. So it was very different, but it was a, yeah, a big lesson. I'll never forget that. One of those humiliations you never, <laughs> <laughs> you, you never forget really. So that was like a, a one big lesson. I mean, I have, I have so plenty. What, was... what do you think the lesson was there? Was just to, to take an easier piece or? What, what well, no, I mean, it was, it was just like a, you're gonna fail mm -hmm. basically <laughs> Sometimes and there's gonna be yeah gonna pretty hurt. badly yeah. it hurts but you have to keep on going mm -hmm. i mean you know it's like it, it's a test like do you really want to do this you know because i know it made me question afterwards like can i really do this like am i cut out for this i know i want to do it but you know okay. as you start questioning yourself and then you have to say well i gotta do it i feel i should do it so i keep on going and then um, it, it changes and transforms into something else um, later on. So that, that was a big, uh, big lesson, really. Failures are good. Like, they, they make you learn. And, of course, yeah, there was a lot of these things, like uh, just the simple fact that you really have to be prepared if you, <laughs> you know, want to play a piece. Like, you know, it's just, like, not... I was, like, I lacked experience and stuff, so it was very... You know, it was a, it was good learning uh, good learning process um, let me just jump in there for a second uh, while you think about another one uh, I have to say that reminds me of uh, an, a story that I have um, which <coughs> now now that I recently I, Many of the people listening may know I'm working on my autobiography, so it has me thinking about my life and context all the time these days. And something I just kind of noticed recently, I guess I've noticed it before, but it just jumped out recently was um, when I went to Brooklyn College Conservatory of Music, right? I entered it in 98, um, I guess in August or something like that. I went to take the exam the audition for the guitar performance program i wanted to be a perform in performance major in guitar and there was, i was a heavy metal rock guitarist i played jazz in high school but i didn't really understand i didn't learn how to play jazz until college really so um i couldn't do that so i was going to audition as a classical guitar player and i did about a year and a half of classical guitar in, in high school with the help of my high school guitar teacher. But, uh, you know, my classical skills were pretty s different than what I could do on, as a rock guitar player. So, sorry. <laughs> so, you know, I knew how good I was, but my classical guitar playing wasn't exactly showing that. So, anyway, um, I prepared Bereni Minor, which I had really worked really hard at, you know, uh, Bach's Bereni Minor. And a couple of studies, like etudes. And uh, I think I did them pretty well. But uh, afterwards, I don't know if I got the news right away, but they told me, yeah, those those pieces are just too easy. So, you know, sorry, you're not in the program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> you know, it's too easy. That's basically what they told me. <laughs> And you didn't really play them that great, you know. Something that's like, <laughs> I was like shocked. I'm like, me? I'm like the best guitarist I know. <laughs> but, but that's, you know, that's really how I felt. I really felt like I never met a better guitar player than me. It sounds so, you know, full of myself. 
But that was my experience. You know, there were some guys locally who were better than me at this or that, but I didn't. I just <clears throat> couldn't believe it. You know, that's funny. You know, and uh, but so I the the it was a great um, setback because then I just decided I'm not going to wait till next term to re audition. I don't like classical guitar that much, so I'm going to practice it like crazy. So I said, why not just go in as a composition major because I'm composing and I had to put the notes down. I had some books filled with music already. And I went in and I showed a different teacher for a different audition. This is my, I'm a composer. Look, I could do this. I know how to write. And I got in as a composition major. And thank goodness, you know, because I'm a creator. So if I was a performance major, I would have been kind of forced to focus on performing other people's music which would have its own benefits and whatever but n knowing who I who I am now I'm so glad I, I didn't go that route because I got to really focus on learning how to compose original stuff and also arrange other people's anyway that was a key turning that was a great uh, really fortunate setback you know now that I think about yeah. it I'm very glad that I failed that audition and it was humble <laughs> at the same time you know like no, you're actually not as good as you think you are. I really couldn't believe it. I'm like, me? I didn't? <laughs> but it's good. It's it funny. <laughs> I get it. Uh, so we got a couple more people joining. Hey, uh, Tom Patterson. Hello, Anna Dekovitzer and Samantha Katz. And uh, Nick rejoined. Um, so if you have any uh, funny stories you'd like to share of that maybe music related or yeah that, uh, that could kind of funny might be. probably a lot of those <laughs> <clears throat> oh yeah oh uh, yeah I remember this was so funny yeah I I, uh, I remember um, it was like when I was studying in Amsterdam my friend got me into for a couple of gigs with a <clears throat> with a band that played like uh, they're mostly Israelis so they played some of the you know like traditional like uh, Hasidic Jewish like Hasidic Jewish music and then we played also some pop music and I remember our first gig was in this um, I think he was like a how do you call it a senior home or like one of those uh, oh, yeah. like big like yeah in, in like on the outskirts of Amsterdam <laughs> And we we practice hard. I mean, like that week, we just had to learn like three five hours of music. I don't know, like just sheet music and like we read mm -hmm. and like all these pop songs. So, it was, and I, I think our, our singer was like not so experienced. Like she's like a you know a lady. She sings songs, but you know she can sing both in like Hebrew and uh, English. So it was convenient. You know, be, you know she could switch between. And I think she wasn't a professional, but so we go there. <laughs> and yeah we we start i think the plan was we we start with uh i think it was stevie wonder piece uh, uh i just called like what's the okay. name i just called yeah yeah and, and it starts like you know it's like a first gig for a song and we start like dong ta dun dun dong ta dun dun dong ta dun 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 and she goes you're just too good to be true like a different song and you and we're like and then like we switched to that song and we we kept on playing the song from deer hunter or whatever i don't i don't remember and she sang that song but then when she finished the words of that song, the trumpet player made an attempt to start playing the melody from a Stevie Wonder song. So we switched back to Stevie Wonder. <laughs> and she didn't get it. She <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, this is one of those things you never forget. Oh, yeah. It's a pretty awesome experience. <laughs> and then, uh, it's just funny, but you know. It's, harmless, essentially. Yeah, right? it was it's pretty harmless, but just... Uh, just uh very funny i mean it's like there are like quite a quite a few um funny stories like that i mean some gigs you you play or you just can't believe you ever played them you know <laughs> oh that wasn't one of those it was quite okay but um yeah it's just uh, 
odd things happened. Uh, yeah, embarrassing things happened. I remember in my head, we played in one bar where this guy was giving us these wireless mics mm -hmm. and the batteries were running out. Imagine. <laughs> it, it, it's just like, he gives, like we're playing this venue and you start playing and the singer, like the battery goes out and her mic stops working. I'm like, mm -hmm. and then it was funny. The guy was like, you guys are so unprofessional. <laughs> like you have to keep on going. I'm like, what do you mean? You know, yeah. like our main singer is like Mike died because you don't have proper batteries for it. Like, and I, you know, honestly, I rarely see, like usually see stuff like this, mm -hmm. like bars around Manhattan. Like you never see like wireless mics, like for the whole band. I mean, it's just not really practical if you think about it. <laughs> um, the battery powered, like wireless Mac mics. I mean, it's just funny. Uh, and mm -hmm. And then, you know, they were, these mics were just dying randomly while we were trying to play music. And they were, like, criticized for um, for getting, a, like, a little bit moved by the, you know, by the turn of events. Yeah. So, anyway, it's, like, many of these uh, things are pretty, <laughs> pretty hilarious. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to think of any uh, funny memories I could share off the, off the top of my head from, uh, I'm sure some some of uh, the bands, uh, musicians I play with can tell me a lot of ridiculous memories um, that involve me too, that I'm just like conveniently forgetting, you know, but uh, <laughs> um, anyway, so I'll just go to a different question instead, but uh, so I know like you said, you may not regard your activity in music as a career uh but you clearly have tons of experience in music and and you've many times it's been your source of income right yeah. and sometimes not or whatever uh many i, I would say probably for the maj vast majority of people who do music that's the case yeah so just, I, yeah. I, I would say <clears throat> just to throw out my s concept one time I, I was inspired by learning the meaning of the word career. Do you know, like the, the verb career, what it means? Mm. No, please. Uh, it, it means to tend towards. So like if, uh, you know, like imagine like the trajectory of a planet in space or something. It's careering. Is a car To career in a certain way means to have a trajectory. So essentially career means... The trajectory of our life in a sense oh that's cool like so, carrying you know, you know yeah. it's a similar word yeah kind of like the direction you know. so um so i think in that sense you certainly have a career a musical career yeah yeah that's know. true yeah we usually like related to i mean you know that making a living and kind of like comes from music, well so i mean that not. and also like yeah it could like a kind of continuous but actually it's like for everyone was like that i mean even bach was like and he was even teaching Latin and he was an organist and mm -hmm. it's like composing and you know I mean I think musicians always had to like you know some composers taught music performed and did many things even in the old days but nowadays that's so I mean it's so common we all have to do many things mm -hmm. and if you think about it it is fair in the sense that um, mus especially musical uh, creators, like meaning c composers, I guess, um, we need to draw inspiration from somewhere, right? So if we do the That's same true. thing every day, it would be harder to draw inspiration. We don't, it's we true. We can't relate to other people and what the, av the, av the everyday person goes through. It's true. Yeah, actually, too. it's true. When I was studying, I, I did like the fact that I had to work jobs and to support myself and like hang out with a lot of like crowd a lot of different types of people working many different types of jobs and like and have, you know just develop an understanding of their life what they're going through and uh, it's a great thing and uh, yeah it's pretty it does make sense because like you 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 yeah you cherish your rich life experience mm -hmm. and that gives you a uh, yeah 
It's a great gift. Yeah, I think when I'm feeling sorry for myself along my journey and then I interact with people who may be better off financially than me or something like that, but uh, I notice that um, maybe are suffering with uh, without an outlet to let, let to release their suffering, or maybe it's um, yeah somehow they're they're uh, maybe how can I put this um, sort of materially um, more uh, successful than me, right? Whatever that may mean. But uh, I, I won't say necessarily spiritually, who knows, but certainly on some level, they're not like, fully uh, self-expressive. And I can sense that, and, and I sense a, a pain from that inability to be fully self-expressed. So interacting with people on various wavelengths helps me to realize that, man, my life may be... Uh, I may have my limited beliefs on how uh, how successful I am, but um, but I have the ability to create every day. I have the ability to reach people, uh, and I have the ability to express myself, even if no one pays attention. I know how to do it, you know. And if, or if it's just one person or, or three people or ten people that are affected by what I do. At least I know how to do that, and I feel many people probably don't even know how to access that creative mm. potential within them in a healthy way, you know, so they get stuck in unhealthy ways, maybe, or introversion. Or, yeah. You know, so anyway, it's that interaction with people um, that are in a different life situation that en enables me to appreciate what I may not otherwise appreciate. Yeah, yeah, I understand what you mean. Yeah, mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. So, um, <clears throat> what? Okay, so uh, so back to the question I was trying to ask before. Um, regardless of whether you say you have a career or not, would you agree with the following sentiment about the music business, which is? If you don't truly love what you're doing, uh, then pick another career. It's just not worth it. <laughs> if you like, you mean what? Did it, you then do? music. If you don't love music, definitely don't try it as a career because it's just you're gonna go crazy. Well, in a way, yeah, it's true. Um, I feel that you know I, I personally love tradition and like. Uh, you know, looking back to classical period or whatever, I think, um, and you know, knowing stories from ancient times, like from China, for instance, and like artists were considered very special people. And, you know, in back people believe that, you know, you, you have to be, have enough virtue to be an artist in life. And so I feel, you know, if you're truly an artist, it's not something it's in a way it's predestined so it's like i feel it's not even like how oh, you you know like rarely people think oh yeah i want to make money i'm going to be a musician i mean you know what i mean it's like I'm not saying that you know it's just like it, for me that was never a concept in my mind like i just want to play music i didn't really care and actually i never even you know when i went to conserve it was the first time when i kind of realize, oh, I'm going to, like, you know, professionally train myself and be a professional. But until then, I just want to play music. I never even consider myself, mm -hmm. like, I want to make money with music. So, yeah, I can't relate to that concept at all. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like I can't imagine someone being like, yeah, you know, I don't really like music, but I can make, like, so much money. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's kind of crazy. You know, even if you become, like, a, I mean, yeah, it's just, well, it is true. Some people are produced, and it's like all these stories that we hear. Actually, it's a lot of them are fake, like discoveries or whatever. That's actually a lot of stuff in the popular culture is like 
created and produced and like uh, it's not like this kind of magical discovery story it's like really planned mm -hmm. and so there's like a lot of that illusion present so I don't think uh, you know in those cases yeah sure they pick someone to make you know that's how industry you know pick someone that looks like could oh we could hit this and make money with this and that but I don't think the artists themselves think that way Mm -hmm. You know, they might be thrown into that or used for that, but yeah, m mostly people like get into it because they like it and <laughs> they want to do it. So I, I guess, yeah, yeah, you could say that. I just never met a person like that. I was like, <laughs> yeah, you know, I didn't really want to be a musician, but I realized I could make tons of money with it. And then, you know, I just did it. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe. <laughs> Maybe some people who are like in the tradition of family, you know, they just like inherit right, yeah. or, you know, they're just thrown it into it from early age. But eventually they grow to like it if they stay with it because, I mean, yeah, it's just like I, well, it's, I think I think where that can't question came from is, you know, I've seen on my journey people who uh get kind of peripherally interested, you know, get seeking, they're like, oh, yeah, I want to, I want to do, start a, a business, I want to, I don't know, create a, some online business here, I want to be a race car driver, I want to be a baseball player, and then, like, hey, yeah, music's great, too, you know, oh, I could be in a bass player in a band, cool, and then, you know, like, I want to just do that, like, they just kind of a little bit, whatever is cool, and or whatever opportunity pops up and they think, well, hey, the music's a good one. You know, I want to be in the spotlight. I don't want to, but they don't, their heart really isn't like this sort of like. It's I possible too. Really. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's some people like I can't not do it. And I would say we're both in that category, right? Yeah. But some people probably can not do it. <laughs> and if you can not do it, then you probably you shouldn't do it. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's. I mean, if you want to. There, I'm it's sure just, there are cases so like, to, yeah. I, I don't want to say it's so hard to be in the music business because that's um, it's a belief, a right? limited belief. But it's been my experience <laughs> that to make regular income and have any sort of sense of stability, it's uh, just an ongoing challenge that you may be able to avoid in a in a more traditional job, right? Yeah, you it's know. true. I mean, that's why we. You know, and it's like why we have to take a job sometimes. But mm -hmm. for me, to be honest, like over the years, I, I'm not, in all honesty, like I'm not so attached to it anymore. And actually, I know it sounds like a paradox. The less I'm attached, the better I can do it mm -hmm. <laughs> somehow, you know. Oh, yeah. When I was like, yeah. yeah, when I was studying and stuff, I was really like, yeah, I want to play music all the time. And then, you know, later through, you know, over the life of the journey, I, you know, now I'm like, I, I don't really have to do it to be f happy. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, it's, I, it's really not that thing anymore, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean I don't like it anymore. I just like, I don't have to do it to be happy. I don't have to do much to be happy, really. Mm -hmm. like a couple coffee is enough in the morning sometimes mm -hmm. <laughs> you know it's just it's more simple in that way I, I would say my life became more simple and I like it better that way mm -hmm. um, so yeah I do know what you mean mm -hmm. the, yeah I just yeah didn't meet many people like that mm -hmm. or like oh man you know dang I just really don't want to do music but I have to and, and I'm sure there are cases like that but you know it's just mm -hmm. like I, I didn't meet many people so I have a, I have a question about um, maybe let's say someone's listening to this podcast and they're thinking okay it's it, currently what it's July 19th 2020 so we're still in uh, I don't know how strict it is but I think we're still more or less in lockdown right or quarantine or, I know I guess I don't know, so. phase 3 4 I don't know what we're in in New York City uh, so things are loosening up. There are people um, that are just breathing in the, the good old fresh air without a mask, uh, like mm. like I am. But um, <clears throat> let's say people who've been maybe indoors a lot, 
people who are uh, maybe still indoors a lot and who maybe feel stuck. Maybe they lost their job or they lost their sense, their compass. They're just not sure what's coming next, maybe in fear. Any words of advice, any guidance, encouragement you can give to people who may be feeling lost or down right now? I mean, it's hard to... Um, I feel that um, at this moment, uh, um, it's a great time for self-reflection. And um, I think, you know, since ancient times, people believe that this type of adversity happened for a reason. Like, uh, you know, I feel history should have taught us lessons, positive lessons, but somehow people have problem learning positive lessons from history. <clears throat> Plagues always happen in a time of when morality of mankind hit the, like, bottom and i think unfortunately this is the time we live in today uh, where you know uh, morality or you know it's just like not a word that many people think about i mean don't mean to be judgmental we all have flaws and that's exactly the point <clears throat> i'm trying to make is like i, I feel that people really uh, we all need to work on ourselves and seriously look at our own mistakes and uh, sincerely try to improve ourselves as people. And I think mo like going back to good moral values and kindness is the only way to improve the situation really. And um, you know, I mean, like before people you know, saw plagues and stuff as the divine punishment or whatever, and no matter how out of the, you know, s scope that seems these days, and that might be like a far-fetched talk, and, you know, there is a reason behind everything, and of course it's very unfortunate, but um, instead of looking externally, I think we should look more internally, and also like go back to traditional values, and uh, be more humble, and really um trust more into things that um we don't see maybe <laughs> but are out there and uh you know there's a i believe there are deeper reasons behind everything so my advice is more just um you know for me what keeps me going is like my practice and you know it's just like i try to just have faith and be positive and as kind as i can be and um, don't really want to judge and I don't want to get involved in conflicts or whatever because I think that doesn't solve anything and uh, I think fear is the definitely not going to solve anything and actually the, it's like constantly trying to fix things on the surface instead of like digging out the root problems that we have is it's just a common thing in the human world today but at the end it doesn't solve it just deepens the problems mm -hmm. and you know just uh, i see a lot of unrest but it's just a reflection of people's inner state and um, like you know emotions of anger jealousy uh, lust for this or that greed getting um you know just manipulated and we live in a society that kind of feeds on that, unfortunately, largely at the moment. So I feel if we want to transcend, we have to kind of follow the values, the higher moral requirements and have more self-restraint and tolerance. And I think that's the kind of what we need the most. That's like tolerance, self-restraint and like, you know, following the traditional path, going back to our true selves, and, you know, looking up more to, um, you know, divinity and what's beyond us. Protective forces. Right? Yeah, and, and yeah, not like, and not, um, 
constantly try to use our narrow human ways to deal with things and mm. just blindly follow mm. science or whatever someone says uh, because you know essentially that doesn't solve problems mm -hmm. and uh, yeah so yeah it's kind of shifting the things and in, in turning this into a good thing and uh, like a vehicle for improvement instead of a vehicle for like fear and more conflict and destruction and just uh, yeah so thank you so i so in a nutshell basically you would encourage someone who's feeling uh maybe fearful maybe anxious maybe depressed from the situation now to uh go inward um begin to uh focus more on, on character reflection spirituality. spirituality that's definitely i mean the, yeah definitely mm -hmm. it's it's uh because uh, it's the, like the that's the first battle and it's the biggest battle with ourselves so being like uh, <laughs> yeah embodying that and just being more kind and you know more tolerant mm -hmm. and yeah it's just uh, yeah that's my advice mm -hmm. watching the news less and <laughs> you know, fighting on the social media platforms less. Yeah, maybe not and right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and not like, uh, you know, so yeah, much. or, you know, not just being, just being, not being like intolerant towards other opinions mm -hmm. and trying to see a bigger picture mm -hmm. uh, in all of this. So, I heard recently uh, some from a <coughs> inspirational speaker Infinite Waters, actually, who said, um, uh, he quoted that Bruce Lee was apparently was said that uh, he never he never had an opponent. Every battle he fought was with himself. Hmm. Pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so my friend Lou, Louis LaRocco, says, to a comment, navigating a sustainable career in the music business is like riding a bicycle down a mountain, wearing a blindfold during a hurricane. <laughs> That's very encouraging. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bicycle down a mountain, wearing a blindfold during a hurricane. Yeah. So I guess he could basically vouch to say that um, it's not so predictable and there's not that much of a sense of security to no. navigate an ongoing It's like career. a lot of faith then, if you're willing to do that. Yeah, a lot of faith. <laughs> kind of and courage. Faith. <laughs> and a little bit, yeah, confidence in your skill to keep your balance. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I definitely, I hear you there, Lou. Um, so I'll wrap it up a little bit soon. Uh, I don't know um, if there's a question I forgot. Is there anything else you want to share, Nemanja, while we're here? Mm. What, what else can we share? Do you have any ideas? Um think we've been through a lot i don't know yeah we have been uh I'll just say anything like oh one question i forgot to ask is um are there any books that you like to recommend to people or movies that you you think would inspire people or that you like to give as a gift um sure i would recommend uh, a book that i read daily john fallon which can, can be uh, it's tough. Z uh, H U A N, and then F A L U N. Um, it's available for free download mm -hmm. um, on falundafa.org website. And um, yeah, that's something I would recommend. I, I don't think I could recommend anything more. It changed my life. Um, uh, yeah, I mean that's the first thing that comes to mind um when it comes to movies uh i don't know <laughs> uh, i watch some occasionally but i'm not sure uh, uh, nothing comes to mind now is there, are there any technological developments uh 
that you appreciate um, during, let's say, quarantine times, lockdown, if we're even in that now, I don't know, but certainly in the effects of this COVID-19 scenario uh, that maybe you didn't have 10 years ago or growing up, anything, technological things you uh, value? Mm, well, I guess what we're doing now, I mean, you know, it's easy to connect with people mm -hmm. in a way. So that is a good thing. You know, if I think it's like we shouldn't make things absolute. Like as much as I see negative impact of social media, I also try to keep this positive aspect in mind as well. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to connect with people. And I, I connected with people, you know, from like my or like elementary school uh, friends, like from Serbia. <laughs> very easily and you know com so that communication is kind of nice and this just ability to stream and instantly connect with people and share mm -hmm. good things is a good thing uh, it definitely helps of course it would be better if we could like communicate normally and just hang out more but you know but it's not possible at the moment so that is definitely a positive thing I would say, uh, yeah, um, that, so as much as the, you know, there's a lot of issues now and censorship and certain things that I don't feel are right. On the other hand, I always try to keep a positive perspective that, you know, these platforms enabled me to share a lot of ideas, a lot of music, a lot of good things as well. Mm -hmm. raise awareness about important things mm -hmm. so as much as i'm you know not maybe agreeing with certain things that um, like social media platforms are doing i also am grateful for the opportunity i had over the years to connect with people so yeah try to keep the positive aspects in mind as well and not be absolute and say like okay <laughs> this is all bad and this is all good you know it's like yeah, of course it's at the end of the day you know it's like uh, yeah it's not absolute in, in no, it's not absolute i mean yeah definitely even though yeah sure i would i wouldn't maybe choose things to go this way i prefer more like uh, organic and more different kind of yeah I would prefer a different out, outline of society, but you know, we live where we live, when we live, so mm -hmm. things are gonna change. I also think in the future, so yeah, well, that's, uh, it's definitely not gonna be like this forever. Hopefully, <laughs> you know? so there, there are good things coming too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and th this is good just in and of itself. You know, we could have this conversation and. Yeah, like said, that this was possible. definitely. It's very we spontaneous. We didn't really plan this mm -hmm. at all. Right. right. And I, mean, I just in the backyard, I just grabbed your arm and twisted it, and I said, "Exactly, you got to do this." Tonight. It threatened me. Yeah. Uh, I had to save my life, so. Right. Yeah. Otherwise, I would have uh, given you only one cookie, and not two cookies would be right. That's true. And you wouldn't. Have and you would give me only a half cup of coffee. Right. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, anyway, we shouldn't make that public. But anyway, yeah. it just happened. So, I <laughs> um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, uh, if there are any questions, go ahead, please uh, throw them out, um, throw them towards us. Uh, we're coming up on two hours, so maybe we'll wrap it up within the two-hour framework. It's a nice, healthy, uh, spontaneous podcast. Um, yeah. <clears throat> let's see. Uh, do you have, I know it's kind of impossible to say, but let's say you can, uh, let's say we're not dependent on the random events of society. Do you have any plans in the next few months? Well, that's, yeah, it's tough to say, actually. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know about long-term plans. I, uh, yeah, just uh, try to keep on working and 
um, keep on raising awareness about issues I think that matter. I mean, it's I keep it very simple. Maybe this week I'll drive up upstate and go for a nice hike. That's kind of one of my plans, <laughs> and yeah. go for a, like a, like a little trip. And I really feel mm. like doing that. But um, in terms of yeah, keep on sharing music uh, whenever I can, and uh, I keep it very simple. I have no idea what's gonna yeah. happen when uh, I'll be working more. So yeah. One one question that I forgot to ask or um, didn't think of before now is: uh, Do you have any fond uh, memories of teaching guitar like any sort of golden moments or or it could be just like struggles that you think are worth telling about let's say we have music teachers out there perhaps or just teachers in general who might want to uh, hear something encouraging or like oh wow he went through that you know so you know, all, all, all teachers have struggles. So you may, I don't know if you're teaching at the moment, but I know you're also a teacher. Um, yeah, I haven't sort of teaching been students. teaching for some time, but uh, yeah, I had plenty of students over the years. I mean, um, I think most of, well, a lot of us are in the situation where we teach kids that go to after school. Mm -hmm. So they're not like geared to be like, great musicians or whatever a lot of the kids are just there because parents put <laughs> mm -hmm. i mean let's face it that's a fact right. so like my overall teaching experience in the music school where we met and stuff was that i realized that i'm not like just a guitar teacher i'm there like kind of to help them in different ways and it, it depends like of course i had students that were very talented and really wanted to play guitar and that was very rewarding and um very um like inspiring and great to see but most of the time i was dealing with kids that you know didn't really they just were there and they just play guitar and you know some of them didn't want to be there but I, I realized that they needed, uh, after a while, I started realizing that they needed some someone else, like they needed a friend too, and someone they could, you know, share stuff with. And, uh, oh, look at that. And um, um, so I had to expand my view and not see myself only as a guitar teacher. So what I'm saying is like in, in simple terms is like if you're in that situation, it's like, oh, I have to teach these kids and they're not like really practicing and stuff to understand that maybe that's not Why what you, you yeah, exactly. Yeah. You might have to find uh, like a reason why they're there and a way to help them and inspire them to be better. And I had, like I had uh, one of my last students was uh in the school was uh, this girl was really autistic and very strange. Like I, I had, I had a little girl that wouldn't talk ever. Mm. Like at the le you know, mm -hmm. at the lesson. And then I had to learn how to work with her and make her feel more and more comfortable and start to get, get her play guitar. And then, and, uh, and then she started opening up and like even singing and you know it was very nice so it I realized like okay this kid is here for you know not necessarily to learn how to play guitar great but to like get more confidence and become more you know just more social and so and then one of the yeah one of the girls was like really autistic and like she wouldn't talk she was very like shy and and then it was a process of like understanding how to break those shells. And eventually she started really liking the lessons. And I remember she cried really hard when I was leaving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was like, uh, that was, you know, it was good to see. So I would just encourage people to, to kind of be broad minded as much as they can be. Mm -hmm. And because yeah, very often it's not that fun if you think like oh, okay you know all these kids have to practice really and be like great and 
it's not gonna happen that often unfortunately yeah. no matter how you try to inspire them it's just you know it it's most of the time that's not what happens but they need something else mm -hmm. um, that, that you can give them yeah so. that's, that's pretty deep yeah I, I think I hope most teachers have that attitude but I, I don't know if it's true that they're willing most teachers are willing music private music teachers are willing to look that deep you know I do know some teachers are a bit demanding they just kind of want results to show Parent which is, I mean, of course, it's naturally, you know. that's what, what you're there for, so you have mm -hmm. to, but I think, uh, um, I think essentially people just want some kind of improvement in their kids, mm -hmm. and, you know, as we talked before, like, not many of them really want to push them in a music career, and that, as a matter of fact, they're hoping that their kids will never like music that much. <laughs> <laughs> they all decide to <laughs> have it as a career. So yeah, that's that's like no matter how good, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they practice too much is not good either. Right. You know, and, and it's sad. Yeah, I had like a few students that were like really talented, but they were like, no, no way I'm going to do music. Like, dang. That's yeah. sad. But, you know. So, uh, just want to just chime in here. Louis Lavaco says, great stream as usual. Love the spontaneity and spirit as well. Thanks a lot, Lou. I really Thank appreciate you. you chiming in, letting us know how it's going. It means a lot. And I guess that means that the sound is okay because he's a, he's a sound guy, so he would let us know. That's so, good. Thanks a lot, man. Um, yeah, the teaching thing. <clears throat> um, I do find that... Uh, so many times in my my teaching uh, career, if you want to call it, yeah, it's definitely a teaching career. I've found like whatever I thought my job was is not the job. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's really disturbing to realize that. It's surprising. It's like what kind of lie, you know? But, but I'm like, all right, I, whatever. I have to just use my wisdom now, my inner wisdom, built-in guidance system to figure out what my job is. Because it's not what I told you it was going to be. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was saying, too. It's like most of the time, it's not, doesn't end up like being that at all. And, uh, yeah, and uh, I mean, I had kids break up and cry and stuff. Like, they just want to play and they can't because they're too busy. I think that's a sad part of the life we live in at the moment. It's just parents, you know, they're too busy and they just want to keep their kids busy. But kids need to play. And uh, yeah, people should never forget that. And I, I had kids, like, they just want to play with me on the lesson. But, you know, I can't just play with them. Mm -hmm. I can make it playful. But, you know, like yeah. the parents are paying for a music lesson. So it's not like we can just play ball mm -hmm. during the guitar lesson and then, you know, just pretend, you know, everything's okay. Because that's not what their parents are paying for. But then on the other hand, I, I felt really sad. I remember I had this kid who just, well, at one point, I'm just asking, why, why don't you ever practice, you know, what's the... You know, it's like we got to, like, do something here. You know, you, you can't, you're not here for no reason. But then he said, I just want to play. I never play. And he's mm -hmm. like a little kid, and he's, like, crying. And then I understood. I felt really sorry for him. You know, I was like, okay, I understand. Mm -hmm. And and that's, um, when I was a kid, there's no way, you know, I just <laughs> played. <laughs> And when I was his age, like, what well, guitar lessons? Forget it. You know, I mean, I like music, but there's no way in that yeah. point. I just want to play soccer. I want to play. It's a nightmare. Yeah. Do this forced thing. And, and, then, and then not just that. that. You have yeah. phone work. You have this. You have that. You have, like, like whatever, mm -hmm. fencing or uh, whatever. I'm not saying it's bad. It's just, like, dude, you know, kids need to play. Just let them play. <laughs> That's all they want, basically. Yeah. And, you know, it's like this, you know, I could go on, but the way the system is set up and like public schools and, you know, it's, it's very sad way to live, you know, just like inside sitting, you know, it's so many hours and it's like, who wouldn't be some, bored? Some schools with bars and windows, like yeah. in prison. Who wouldn't be bored? So that was kind of, yeah, it's hard. 
um, in that oh, yeah. case you kind of you need a lot of empathy and wisdom to deal with these situations and kind of make it interesting for kids and still not disappoint but yeah. I had situations when I had to tell parents like you're wasting your money <laughs> I yeah, felt yeah. compelled and it was very hard to do. Like yeah, that. yeah. Really it's very it. hard, you know, and I know it, it brought like a little bit of hardship to the boss and I didn't like that either, but I felt really bad yeah. like for the kid also because the kid didn't want to be there anyway yeah, <laughs> in the first not, place. Not. And then, you know, their parents are paying all this money and they're not going anywhere. They're not practicing. They're not doing anything. And that was rare, but you know, like maybe a couple of times I just had to say it and be like, you know what? Yeah. Nah. Yeah. And, no, that, that's, that's good. You know, and, but some, you know, I've had a few situations like that where even if like, I remember one, one student, I don't know, they were really good. It was a brother and sister and they were, they were very good. Didn't really love being there. Never too cheery when they came. But they liked me, and they always learned, and they always cooperated, and they were getting better. But in between, you know, whatever was going on, they too much schoolwork, too much whatever. They kind of, if they were going to enjoy the guitar, it was going to be by like just having fun. They weren't, they didn't want any expectations with it, you know. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, because they're kind of good, and the parent, you know, there's like this tiger mom thing, right? The parent really wanted them to succeed or whatever. Because a lot of, sometimes parents have uh, this competitiveness with each other, you know, with their, their children, their friends' children, and uh, fellow students. Um, and so the pressure was to get this exam, some like official exam where they would get Yeah, I, I had that too. And I didn't, so <laughs> I didn't we, really. <laughs> I, I don't like it, but I would say, I would always try to cooperate. If someone really wanted, I'm like, I could, I'll step up to the plate, I could teach it. But then I got to go into kind of like not so nice John mode because otherwise they get no results. If I yeah, yeah. Like sort of like it's tough. put some pressure on them. And anyway, so I started, I warned them. I said, I'm going to be, become kind of strict. They go, oh, ha, ha, yeah, okay, great. Two or three lessons in, they just disappeared, they didn't come back anymore. And it was with them for a long time. They, they were, they, they yeah, liked that's... me, you know, but then they, they, just, they had enough and, and, I guess they were complaining to their mother enough that she pulled them out. But that sucks, you know? Yeah, it is. And it, especially if you kind of like develop a relationship and you see them benefiting. And yeah, I had that the same thing, unfortunately, that, that like with one of the, the girls that was saying that was like super shy and, you know, wouldn't talk. And it really got her like even to sing. And then they pulled her out of the lessons for a few months. Mm -hmm. And when she came back, she was the same like when she came first oh, yeah, like, it was like all that work disappeared yeah, and yeah. now we're back at the ground zero you know like beginning and there, it was kind of sad to see so it's in that sense it was especially like it was more about like kind of helping kids break through their like you know like work on their character improve their character and it was like more why they were there. And then if you stop doing that, they just revert to the old ways. And mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. I definitely noticed there was part of the element of being regularly there at the job teaching was some young people, some kids needed a schedule. Yeah. You know, they needed a dependable thing yeah. that they can go to with the teacher um, that, so I could see for certain students, I was their music teacher, and they appreciated me. The parents appreciated me for that, but I was also, not, I wouldn't say a counselor or anything, but I was like a, a regular presence, like a, sort of a relief for the parents. Cause also, they, they trusted me that I was going to do my best, and that the parents needed that uh, that extra thing, you know. So some students did need that extra thing, you know, like they almost couldn't be too much for certain students because they just needed external sort of uh, attention. Some really just, some wanted to just play by themselves, but some needed that things to do, you know, mm -hmm. depending on 
of student. So anyway, uh, I just want to say thanks, Lou, Louis LaRocco. He said that, uh, yes, uh, he, I've got some small adjustments you can make, but it, overall it's definitely clear and it's working uh, in terms of, like, the setup. He cool. a few things. Definitely a good job for the on-the-fly trial by fire. So thank you. <clears throat> cool. Thank you. Um, so I guess my, my eyes are fading. Uh, my Mine too. My phone is 15%. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's, oh, we're out after midnight. Holy smokes. That's crazy, know. isn't it? Yeah. Well, okay, so now it's July 20th. Yeah. So you started off this day, which has meaning to you, by... Well, unfortunately, speaking. that's uh, the... Yeah, the day uh, when the, the persecution in China was uh, launched in 1999 mm -hmm. by Jiang Zemin against Falun Gong practitioners, which is actually a legal persecution because they never broke any law and they didn't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. Just people who want to practice meditation, very simple, but unfortunately out of his jealousy and malice, the popularity of the practice mm -hmm. and then it became very difficult because a lot of false propaganda was launched that like evil cult propaganda and mm -hmm. even the Tiananmen Square self-immolation completely staged the incident where these four people burned themselves were not even Falun Gong practitioners and it was like there's a video evidence of that how showing called false fire so it's a very sad thing it's been going on 21 years and unfortunately a large part of the world has been turning away mm. and but I, I think more and more people know the truth over 350 million Chinese people quit the Communist Party really? Chinese really? yeah they quit the CCP and its affiliated organizations mm. um, and uh, did, like everyone who was once a member basically is encouraged to uh, quit the party and denounce it because I know that coming from a communist yeah I was one of the last generations of pioneers and the brainwashing and luckily I had a teacher who was very aware and he was anti-communist and he taught us like what he believed is right and I was very lucky mm -hmm. so I was never really brainwashed but uh, so anyway um people are encouraged to disassociate themselves from the Chinese Communist Party because they killed 80 to 100 million of Chinese people over mm -hmm. the last few decades. They've been harvesting organs from prisoners of conscience, which is a crime that never happened in history. Like killing alive people for organs and sit, like treating them like, you know, it's just horrific what's happening there. and. Yeah, so I hope that, you know, next year won't have to, <laughs> you know, it's like uh, that uh, this persecution will stop, really. And it's been too long, 21 years of, mm -hmm. like, mass persecution like that. It's, it's a long time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, so hopefully. Yeah, I think it's common that... Uh the devilish nature of authority when allowed to, uh, you know, go un uncontrolled or unquestioned. You know, yeah. Will, will, will become, will rear its ugly claws, whether it's through jealousy, anger. It often, you know, definitely regards jealousy when ordinary people show that they have autonomy and that they have their own power and that they can... Um, they think for need, themselves. Yeah, right. They don't need to rely on that yeah. government, you know. Um, yeah. That will happen, unfortunately. It's a sad history. It, it is. It is. And uh, now more than ever, it's imp like it's coming back to, I think, is the, the, there has never been a time where truth was more important. Because it's obvious that we live in a pretty intense times and the world is changing. And I think knowing the truth and making the right choice and, you know, sticking to good friends <laughs> mm -hmm. is definitely crucial. 
and if if you see the statistics the the places that have been hit the hardest also with covid-19 are the exactly the places who work the closest with chinese communist party mm-hmm. and that's very telling in my opinion because mm-hmm. you know it's like if you work with the devil you won't end up in heaven that's for sure <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. talking in very old terms, but you know, like, it's like, yeah, are you an accomplice then? Mm-hmm. Um, it's really, it's crucial for people to say no to CCP now. And it's been really, I think, so important. That's why I encourage people uh, to, Chinese people, to quit the Chinese Communist Party. This is not a political move for me. I don't care about politics at all. And I don't care about Chinese politics for sure. <laughs> Being a U.S. citizen, <laughs> you know, it's not in my interest. Never was. And but if there is a force in the world that persecutes millions of innocent people and bullying the world like this, like they have been for so many years, then it's something that needs to stop. And that's a force that needs to be stopped. Mm-hmm. And I think people really yeah, should take the righteous stand. And, say no to ccp enough you know so hopefully yeah yeah no it's good we will see a different year next year you know Mm -hmm. we won't have to talk about persecution anymore you know i really hope for a better world Mm -hmm. one thing you know that uh i can relate to um of course i'm aware of this uh, especially being a friend of yours and but I remember hearing about this in, in 1999 in front of Madison Square Garden, seeing the, per, uh, like the uh, peaceful protest. Yeah, the peaceful protest. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I'm also, whether it's because I'm vegan or whatever, I, I'm, I'm also an animal, animal rights. Uh, I don't know if I, I'm an activist. I guess I am, but uh, I'm not very outspoken about it. But I'm very concerned about it, and when I get literature about the way animals are treated and they're really they're, they're not given the dignity of even being a life form uh, by the government and the torture just sometimes you just to get glue just throw them in this like barrel that that chops them up live are hideous so I, I see that this you know lack fundamentally the bigger you know, as you said, morals and the way I would might word it would be the the bigger problem at hand here is this fundamental lack of respect for the dignity of life. Yeah, lack of compassion or empathy, lack of kindness in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, just a self-driven culture right? Yeah, where really you're like encouraged to think about yourself first. I mean, that's self before others. Yeah. yeah and that's, mm-hmm. that's fundamentally, I think that's a fundamental flaw of yeah. the world we live in. <laughs> it's really like, yeah, it's, and the way we treat mother earth, raping the planet and destroying forests and species, just wiping out species easily, but, and we're destroying large tracts of rainforest in order to, to grow corn or just like one single crop to feed cows that we're going to then ship to our fast food and our beef market. So we're, which are going to give people heart attacks. So, sorry, I'm, I'm generalizing, I'm speak, but essentially we're, we're destroying precious life forms in the name of making a profit and, and satisfying uh, physical very very fleeting physical short-term pleasures you know that essentially are not the generally in in our best health interest that's what i see going on the planet too and uh i think it's all connected if we do live uh you know live uh eat to live not live to eat right yeah i mean it's true but i think it's also the right way to do things right ways to do things so you know farmers have always existed and it, you know before there was no means to eat but to hunt but it's the way you carry yourself and the way you think about it 
is it's just like you know just a natural balance of things and a natural cycle or if it's the greed driving the whole thing so it's, it's like um if morality improves everything will improve mm -hmm. if people change their hearts we all change our hearts for the better the whole world will change if that doesn't change nothing will ever change mm -hmm. and that you know mm -hmm. it's so obvious nowadays yeah, in Nichiren Buddhism, which I practice, uh, there's a concept called human revolution, which is, you know, a change in the heart of one individual can affect the change in the, in the entire world, you know. Um, yeah, so I do definitely believe it starts with me. And uh, because if I believe it starts with me, which I do, um, from the bottom of my heart, then I know I could do something about it. And if I think it's out there, then I feel helpless, you know. Well, you can't really do anything about it. I mean, you can't force people to change. Yeah. <laughs> you can inspire them, and but that's something that takes genuine and sincere effort, and that's something that has to naturally come out of mm -hmm. oneself. It's not something that you can force out of yourself either. Mm -hmm. So, like, laws don't change people, essentially. They can restrain them a bit, but... Right. Yeah. You know, they, they don't really change them. So, the it end is... heart change. Yeah. It makes the difference. All right, guys. So, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up. Uh, yeah. You've been fantastic for all, all, all of you who've s stuck with us for, for some time. And if you're watching the replay or on the podcast or on YouTube or whatever it is you're catching this thank you so much for your time this is once again Nemanja Rebic uh, and where can we find thank you Nemanja if someone wants to contact you well here on Facebook I guess mm -hmm. Look for Nemanja, Nemanja Rebic and, and then Facebook. also like uh, YouTube I have a bunch of videos there yeah and the link will be in the description yeah for and the YouTube channel and the album is on like all these platforms yes and his album High Abode yeah right? uh, which i'll put the link in the description afterwards um so once again have a great night guys and i'll see you soon peace good night everyone